Okay, let's get this, we can get started. So, hi everybody. My name is Phil Larson. I coordinate veteran and military services at the University of Michigan. Um, we are happy today to have um, uh, an author join us, um, talk about his book um, and, and this incredible history. Um, thank you for joining. We've had a wonderful Veterans Week so far. This is day three. Um, we will be doing this uh, today and tomorrow. We have a couple more panels. Um, I thank you for joining us during lunch. And um, we will have an evaluation of this uh, this program too today. So a little later on, we'll be we'll be flashing up a QR code that you can evaluate. So please please stick around for that. Um, we encourage question and answer on the bottom of your of your Zoom screen. There's a Q and A button. So please type in your questions. We'll be reviewing those at the end and and doing some Q and R. But I don't want to talk too long. I'm going to turn this over to John Healy, who's uh, who's the moderator for today. Great. Thanks uh, for the introduction, Phil. Uh, good morning, veterans, friends of veterans, and future veterans. As I introduce, I'm John Healy. I retired from the Coast Guard about five years ago. I currently work as the Director of Student Life Facilities here at the University of Michigan. Very excited to introduce uh, Mr. Doug Stan as our guest speaker. Uh, Doug is a journalist, lecturer, screenwriter, and a New York Times bestselling author. In addition to being an author, uh, Doug lect lectures nationally around current events, international affairs, politics, and writing. He's appeared on national TV and radio outlets, including the Today Show, CNN, Discovery, Fox News, and we'll later see the NBC Nightly News. Doug is the author and founder of the National Writers Series and the Traverse City Film Festival, a multi-day summer event which is easily accessible from Ann Arbor. So please uh, go check it out uh, this upcoming summer. His books include The Odyssey of Echo Company and Horse Soldiers. Horse Soldiers is the basis for a 2018 Hollywood film, 12 Strong. However, today we'll speak, primarily speak about his book in harm's way. As you can see on the screen, the sinking of the USS Indianapolis and the extraordinary story of its survivors. It should be noted that Doug and his wife have founded a scholarship fund uh, devoted to the education of families associated with the Indy. So uh, as Phil mentioned earlier, please uh, use the Q&A for questions. Uh, we'll take that and ask the questions at the uh, end of the uh, presentation. And with that, I'd like to give a warm university welcome University of Michigan, welcome uh, to Mr. Doug Stan. Doug, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you, John. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm up here in Traverse City, Michigan. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, be speaking with you today um, from my home here, and uh, I hope all of you are well. Yeah, Veterans Day is coming up upon us, and as you can see on the screen, and by the way, I can't see you, and uh, I don't know um, if uh, we'll get to the Q&A, but uh, please... Uh, We'll go to get to a part here where I, I want to know a few things about you, and uh, you can ask me some questions. I've written another book about Afghanistan, as John said, and one about Vietnam as well. I think all three of those books, but particularly In Harm's Way, um, is about the humble heroism of that generation, which sadly now is um, predominantly passed away. There is one survivor of the USS Indianapolis, as you see here on the screen, that's an actual picture of the ship. Harold Bray of uh, California uh, is still with us. There were 124 alive when I began to report this story uh, in 1999. Um, the book was an unplanned success. And what I think ultimately we can talk about here is that it really is a story about citizenship. Now, if we were in the room together, I would ask, you know, how many of you know about the Indianapolis? Um, we're going to see a clip from uh, Jaws a little bit, too, uh, which is uh, one of the ways that a lot of people know about this ship. Um, or how many of you and your family uh, are in the Navy? I'm, I'm assuming that there are some. <clears throat> I knew nothing. I'm going to go to um, this slide is about to talk about the unplanned success and kind of set this up before we get into the nuts and bolts and the TikTok of the story, um, In Harm's Way has become popular with young readers. And just recently, this new reader's edition came out, uh, which is very good. It's been adapted by Michael Tugius. And um, that's kind of an interesting idea that someone, you know, eight to 13 years old is interested in World War II. And uh, it really is one of the things that sponsored uh, our family to try to start this scholarship program to get the young students of the survivors of the USS Indianapolis to interview grandpa 
or great grandpa and then write an essay about it. And those were judged by a, a panel of judges. And that's how the scholarship program started. So that's that's why I have this up here, that the story um, has what, what I tried to do in the story was take a popular myth. I'll, I'll jump ahead here by saying if you've seen the movie Jaws, you've heard of the Indianapolis. It's that famous scene where Robert Shaw is talking about delivering the bomb, as he says, and then being sunk and then being attacked by sharks. It explains his obsession with sharks in the movie Jaws. But in reality, um, he, he's a fictional survivor of USS Indianapolis. And that's really what I knew about this story in 1999 when my editor called me from New York for Men's Journal Magazine and suggested I go to Indianapolis, Indiana, on a reunion day of this of this group of sailors and talk to them and see what was there. And I said, his name is Sid Evans. And I said, Sid, isn't that just made up from the movie Jaws? And unfortunately, that's what a lot of people thought about this ship. One of the setups here and the, the way to frame this is that Pearl Harbor is the front bookend of World War II. And the sinking of the Indianapolis is really the back bookend. It's one of the last major actions of World War II. And uh, coincidentally, this ship actually hastens the end of the war, which we'll get to in just a moment. So I thought it was a myth. I thought it was part of a, a movie myth. And it really did not exist in the history books as we as we kind of know them today, especially in the high school curriculums, as you see here in this slide with the Young Readers Edition. <clears throat> this is the ship. It's uh, two football fields long. It's the um, flagship of the Fifth Fleet. It moves around, it's fast. Um, it has carried Admiral Spruance um, through uh, all these Pacific battles that you see right here, it earning 10 battle stars. The Coral Sea in 1942, um, look at on the lower uh, right, Okinawa 1945, the ship, in addition to having been sunk, in addition to kind of moving into American popular culture and myth, um, has a real and serious combat history as a, as a part of the US Navy during the war effort in the Pacific. I point out the Okinawa date here because the kamikaze attack on the USS Indianapolis in Okinawa in 1945 sends it back to California for repairs, <clears throat> which is how it actually begins uh, to be repaired and ends up uh, in this area here of, uh, it's actually Mare Island and then Hunter's Point Shipyard um, that after getting repairs, um, this was taken in 2001 on, when I was, when the book was released. Um, so this is actually what it looked like in 2001. Um, the Indianapolis leaves um, from this area of the California coast and with a secret cargo aboard. And as the caption says, are, they are the secret components of the atomic bomb little boy. Um, nobody knows, if you ask any of the crew members, what's an atomic bomb or what's an atom or what's what's a nuclear explosion, of course, practically none of them would have been able to tell you because their average age is between, not their average age, but I think Gus K from Illinois was uh, 16 at the time on board the ship. Dr. Lewis Haynes from Anistee, Michigan was 33, the senior medical officer. And uh, Captain Charles McVeigh was 48 at the time. So this is uh, a snapshot of young uh, America uh, as the crew of this ship. So the idea of carrying an atomic bomb anywhere is very foreign to them. This is a quick timeline, and I know it's small, but um, they leave from that. They depart San Francisco on July 16th, 1945. Um, on July 26th, they deliver the atomic bomb components, which have been carried aboard the ship in great secrecy. Um, the uh, Some of the components encased in lead, kind of a lead encasement, and then bolted to the to the floor of a, of a quarters. Um, they're delivered to Tinian, which is near Guam. Uh, and then on July 28th, they depart um, Guam for Leyte in the Philippine coast. 
where in July of 1945, a lot of Americans and a lot of um, military um, uh, uh, personnel thought that we would probably be invading Japan in January of 46 or sometime around that. And that's how the war was going to end. Um, so they head off to the Philippines for training in preparation for that. Uh, July 30th, 1945, tragedy strikes. I want to stop for a moment. We're all, it's very, very hot aboard this ship. It's like I say, two football fields long. So it's big, but not enormous. But it is its own world with compartments and it has, uh, and, you know, um, lowly sailors, first class, it has uh, officers, it has uh, a, a complement of uh, black sailors aboard the ship, which has recently been uncovered by um, the USS Indianapolis Legacy Organization. Um, and uh, their story is now being told too, which I'll get to in a little bit in the, in the Q&A. But everyone is sleeping aboard this ship or on watch, et cetera, when just after midnight, uh, two torpedoes um, slam into the ship. And I'm going to jump ahead here. Let's take a look at this um, slide for a moment. You can see that the first torpedo hit is up near the bow. That's also where um, armaments are stored. Uh, it creates an enormous... Um, secondary explosion. And there's a second torpedo hit there too. And Captain McVeigh's bridge, he's the skipper. He's hes the person in charge. You can see he's up there among that superstructure. And he's just, he's retired to his cabin for the night, giving directions to the officer of the deck, you know, and this is key. Um, you know, he says to him, our orders are, we may sail in a straight line if visibility is poor. That is going straight uh, at about a 16 to 17 knot uh, clip. If visibility improves, that is the moon comes out, the clouds part because it was a, it was not a dark and stormy night, but it was dark and murky. Um, then uh, we need to be zigzagging. And if you sail a boat, you know that that just that means moving and tacking across the water in a defensive posture to make it harder for a, a Japanese torpedo to hit uh, the ship. At this time of the night, um, the skies are closed and dark. The moon is not available. But however, it does, the skies do part for this brief moment and Commander Hashimoto I-58, who's not sunk uh, an enemy ship during the entire war, um, rises, periscope comes up, he spots a smudge on the horizon. He is quite certain it is a ship. He begins to track it and identifies it as uh, an American uh, vessel. He begins then to set up the firing positions and he fires. Um, the ship is hit. It's plowing ahead at about 17 knots. It begins to take on water here. As you can see, you can imagine the bow um, crumples. And yet it's impossible to really slow the engines because communication has been cut in the ship. So if you look at the deck there near that gun turret where it says Foxel, there are men sleeping on that. There are men sleeping back on the fantail. Um, they're sleeping in their quarters down below because it's hot and because these were laxed, relaxed sailing conditions. The ship will sink in anywhere between 11 and 17 minutes, which is incredibly fast. In the radio room, if you look back here on the second superstructure, and then and in the, um, there's one up front, uh, one up up towards the bow, there's one radio room too. Um, Jack Miner, uh, a radio man from Chicago, is leaning against the bulkhead, which is what you call a wall in a ship, as the ship begins to list, right? So it's listing and going down. And he is trying, and he believes he's succeeding to get a message out, SOS, that we've been sunk. He sees the needle jump in the radio, but you know the compartment now is tipping, and pretty soon um, he has to get off the ship and you either get off the ship by jumping off the high side. So it's tilted this way, you jump this way or you're on the, 
or you slide off the low side. If you've slid off the low side here, if you look around, you do see some life rafts. They uh, hopefully have floated free and you might be able to um, grab onto one. Um, you've been handed a life raft. Um, I remember speaking with a fellow, and I'll get to him in a moment later, uh, more, Mike Carilla from Chicago, about trying to get life rafts down from this area here midship and hand them out to the guys. Um, uh, you know, it, people don't really realize this, but just because you're in the Navy doesn't mean you know how to swim. And a lot of the a lot of the young men didn't. So you're either in the water in a raft or you're in a life vest. Uh, you might be on a net, a floater net with floats. Um, or you might not have anything at all. But uh, as Giles McCoy, one of the Marines, who's been back in the brig guarding two um, fellow sailors who have been thrown in the brig for misbehavior as punishment. The, he feels like there's some type of giant who's hitting on the walls of the ship with, with a, making it into a gong. He's able to get out as well and uh, finds himself uh, aboard a raft. Um, he says that he, he was floating in the water. Um, ship goes up on its bow, tips up. As we've seen in the movie Titanic, uh, this is a, is, you know, a predictive of that. Uh, the screws are turning and men are jumping off the stern of the ship, neither hitting the screws or not, and landing in the water. And it, it drops into some of the deepest ocean on earth. Uh, and crashes into the ocean bottom. And it is, um, it is uh, after midnight, it's really Monday morning now. So let's say it's like, let's just say it's 12.30 a.m. Monday morning. Um, we think, well, we've just left on this secret mission. We don't know what we delivered, but we're done with that. That was our work. We've complete, completed our chore. We're headed to Leyte now on a regular shipping route. Um you know, people, we have to be missed. It'd be like all of us saying, we're going to leave this um, meeting today and drive home on a regular route and we never arrive home. Well, we think, well, you know, they know that I always take, uh, you know, first street home. So they'll come looking for me so I can fix my flat tire. This is what's on the minds of these young men that sur surely uh, they will have been missed. Um, and by Monday or Tuesday, probably Tuesday, you know, boats will begin looking for them and they can hang on to that time for a number of reasons, which we can get to probably in the Q&A, that doesn't happen. So they are left. This is actually a picture later. We know how this story ends. There is a rescue. But I just wanted to show it here for a moment to show you that they're wearing these vests and the faces are covered in the oil um, that's been released from the ship um and they're either dehydrated they have uh sunstroke photophobia eyes are swollen and, and burned um uh saltwater ulcers um just to give you oh i was gonna john had asked about this map and you know we're, we're we've sunk now and if you look where that circle is where it says marianas um, that's the sinking site. So you can see the Philippines in the far left. Um, you can see where they've sailed from San Francisco. Uh, they do stop at Pearl Harbor. Um, they stop at Guam there in Tinian and deliver their deliver the cargo in Tinian, get orders in Guam, and then they're sunk there. Um, it is... Uh, It is a um, an ordeal that is so uh, testing and galvanizing that I think that's one of the reasons that it does enter into American popular myth later, especially in the movie Jaws, because I want all of us to imagine here just for a moment. Um, we don't know the war is ending, right? So we don't know that in just a, um, uh, a matter of... Uh, weeks it will be over but 
we think that we're getting ready for this big invasion of Japan. This has happened to us. And so surely, um, you know, we there's more for us to to do in the war and in life, and we'll be found. Um, but floating in the water as we are, go back to this life vest right there. And I, I know it's a grainy picture. It's actually a screen grab from some video of, of footage. Um, it's filled with water. And so our hands are swollen. You know how they get if they're in the water too long. That oil that you can see is also coating them. It's coating this, the cloth straps of this vest. The vest is becoming waterlogged. It's Tuesday, Wednesday now. And so we're sinking in the water. And in some cases, the vests are actually starting to drown us. So to, for us to stay together, we begin to put our arms around each other and dog paddle together. Um, we may not know who the other person is. Remember, the ship is like a city. Yeah, I do I do say it's big, but it's not that big. But it is there there are people aboard the ship that you you don't really know. And so suddenly now we're in the water, plus also kind of disguised, um, but bonded and banded together. A group in Dr. Haynes's um care uh, are in the life vests. Uh, there's another, there's some raft, rafters who are floating and everyone's floating at a different speed because just think about it. We're all like human sails. So these, these guys look like they were in a raft. So they're sitting up in the water and there's obviously a wind and a current, which is pushing them in one direction. If we're sunk down in the water, we're moving uh, at our own speed. Um, by Wednesday, rescue hasn't come. So what do we do? I mean, it dawns on us that, we're not missed, right? Because obviously if we were, people would be here now. It's like I say, about 300 miles from approximately from the sinking site to the coast, which would uh, dispatch the rescue ships. This is the interesting moment in the story of the Indianapolis, but it's also an interesting moment in so many stories of survival, which I really believe this is in, in a big way, but also of, of, of stories of combat. Where do you go and what do you do when it seems there are no more corners to turn, you know, when you've run out of time? Who are you? You know, what will you do to survive? Um, these men in particular, and at the heart of this story is in the crucible of this experience, they're really posed with these questions quite starkly. Why? Well, in some cases, you and I might be swimming together, and I so let's just say I'm dog paddling, and I'm I'm miserable too, and I want to give up, but you swim over to me, or our buddy swims over to us and says, you know, it's Wednesday now, although, to be honest, I don't quite think we know it's Wednesday, but we know that rescue should have come by now. Um, this isn't going to end, you know, um, nothing's going to change. So, uh, I think I'm going to end this and you'd have, um, young men looking at their, you know, their shipmates, uh, try to struggle out of their life vests and if they're successful or not typically then swim away beyond the pods of groups which are trying to stick together and, you know, either succumb to exhaustion um, or be dragged down by a shark um, or just, just pass away due to ingestion of salt water or just succumbing to the elements. And so this happens to us and something in the middle of this, however, happens, which is, I, I thought, miraculous when I heard it. Um, and this happens before the rescue. We're floating in the water. Um, the sharks have been, you know, when I say the sharks, it's hard to say exactly how many people are attacked by sharks. Uh, when I spoke with Dr. Haynes at his home in Florida, he... Um, claim not to have seen many sharks or been bothered by them. Some did swim by him, but he, he was he was not um, attacked by them. Other survivors talked about looking down in this crystal clear water, because remember, 
it's about 88 degrees water, very clear. And if there's no wind and it's flat, you were looking down and just, you know, other reports were of seeing sharks circling below. Because obviously they've been following the ship anyway, as it dumps refuse and et cetera off, off board. But <clears throat> the explosion itself would have attracted all kinds of sea life. And so sharks are there. Um, when this, so you're looking down and say you were tucking our knees up, just imagine, you know, floating there, uh, realizing you, you're not going to be rescued uh, unless there's some miracle and wondering, well, and I don't have any water. There's no food. Men begin to cup the seawater like this. And then Dr. Haynes, who's 33, remember, um, he's swimming around, um, you know, trying to minister, so to speak, offer care to these young men floating in his group. And they begin to drink some of them the salt water which of course is f fatal because it's like pouring Coca-Cola into your car's battery. You know, the body um, just, it's already shutting down. It's, it has edema from the ingestion of water and moisture in the lungs. So you're, you, every, everything is going wrong. And he's beseeching them not to drink the salt water, but some of them do. And that can in, in, in um, start hallucinations so some men look down and see the ship sailing beneath them, right? In this crystal clear water, the propeller is turning, smoke coming out of the stack. They begin to swim down to this imaginary ship and swim through its hallways and take drinks out of the drinking fountain, which of course in reality is more salt water. Um, they come back to the surface and tell their buddies, some of them do, you know, there's water down there and more begin to follow. And Dr. Haynes and others are moving around trying to prevent this. And these kinds of acts are going on through all these different groups. And at one point, Dr. Haynes stops because he's also been burying the dead. That is, if you see this slide here, that life vest, if someone perishes, and you don't have a life vest. So he would, he or his his buddies helping him would try to retrieve, would retrieve the vest and then put it onto someone who is still living and so that they could have it. But at the same time, he's collecting dog tags, of course, wrapping them around his wrist. And a dog tag, as you know, is is not heavy. But he had a lot of them. Dozens. And um he just said it just suddenly felt so heavy. Um, he could hardly stand it. And his, his epiphany at that moment was, um, you know, why am I such a failure? Which is an amazing thing for anyone to think under this circumstance. Because the question is, who's watching? What prompted Dr. Haynes to feel that he had to swim around and bury the dead? And what now is really an existential void, right? Where it's void of life, it's void of water. It's the only thing there is water and sky. And when I spoke with him in Florida, he still was deeply troubled um, by this feeling of failure. Of course, he went on later to have a successful medical career, actually serving into Vietnam and developing um, a special uh, treatment to handle blood in combat situations. So he wasn't a failure, but when it came to this moment, um, he would say the Lord's Prayer as he uh, took off the life vest, removed the dog tag, you know, tried, because the body, once you move the um, vest, is likely going to sink or submerge. And so he'd grab it and say the Lord's Prayer and then, re you know, release the body. And even late in his life when I met him, he could not hear the Lord's Prayer repeated um, without it bothering him greatly. And he would have to leave the room if it happened. Um, in the middle of this crisis now, as people are thinking, what's next for me? Some of them begin to hear a voice. And I want to qualify that by saying it wasn't like 
the trumpets and the voice of angels. As I moved around the country when the book came out in 2001, the first edition, I would go to Seattle or Florida, um, in Boston, and, and and in Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, at a bookstore there, there were several survivors. They've all passed away now, the Michigan survivors. Um, and I remember Richard Thalen of Lansing, Michigan, came to Ann Arbor to the bookstore. And, and whenever I did an event, I always wanted the survivors to be there. And I would try to set up the scene and have them tell the story or their 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 story. And uh, Dick said, you know, I heard a voice that one day when it was really grim, um, and it was my father's uh, voice, you know, saying, you're Dick Thalen, don't give up, or Ed Brown from California had a similar experience. He was floating in the water, and his friends were singing the Yellow Rose of Texas. It was a very flat day, looking out across the sea, looked like a ballroom floor, and his buddy said, you know, I'm out of here, Ed. He swam away and Ed was about to. And Ed had the same sense of um, being talked to. And in any case, as I moved around the country, I would hear examples of this. And, you know, you hear it one at a time. You think, well, that's interesting. I mean, you know, these things happen to people under duress. and But heard it enough to realize that... Um, what had saved some of these men, and we can't say it about all of them because not everyone gave up and certainly not everyone who perished gave up, but the ones who the, are, were with us and reported this experience said, you know, Ed, Ed said, as I was, I was going to swim away, but then I heard, you know, Ed, you're Ed, go to football practice or mow the lawn or finish your homework. These young men had the, the sense of being acknowledged or being reminded that they had something to do, uh, that in this void of water and sea life and sun and oil, that there was still some place to go to, a focal point. And, and in many ways, that memory or that apprehension <clears throat> was literally a lifeline. So Ed Brown did not swim away. And so when I, I started this in the, in the setup or the frame of the book, why I think this is a book about citizenship is that um, it caused me to wonder, <clears throat> excuse me, what had I ever said in any, to anyone in a time of um, their own trouble? Doesn't have to be major. What had I said to anybody that they might use in a time of, of that uh, to pull themselves back from some abyss, right? Um, I didn't know if I had, I hoped I had. Um, this book set kind of a new course for me in that regard, thinking of in these terms so that while this is a story about World War II and a story about combat and survival, in the end, it's really about the things we do for each other that we don't know for, about whose effect we, we, we can't be aware, how it's going to affect somebody else. Um, and that, to me, is why the book really is about more than sharks and explosions, but it's about that lesson that a lot of these young men had, that they 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 dragged with them out of the water um, and carried with them through the rest of their lives into the second half of, um, of this, quote, American century, the engine of the, you know, the 1950s and onward. Um, and so that being said, if, if you were to ask Harold Bray today in California, um, you know, have you ever had a bad day? Uh, Harold would say in all honesty, no, I haven't, not really, not compared to what I'd experienced as a very young man. So that, that's the heartbeat of the story in a way. There's lots that happens. Um, I'm going to move ahead here. There's lots that happens because of these two gentlemen right here. Chuck Gwynn on the left and Adrian Marks on the right. Chuck Gwynn, um, you see him here in 1960, I believe, and we'll talk about that in a moment, is called uh, to this day by the group of survivors, the legacy organization, uh, their angel. Chuck Gwynn is flying over 
the Pacific Ocean on a routine patrol with a PV-1. If he spots anything of an enemy combatant, he's to attack it. And as he's flying, he spots a oil slick, a flash on the water, which he thinks might be a disabled Japanese submarine. So as he drops down, ready to approach and perhaps engage it, um, he realizes there are people floating in the water. And it stuns him because, again, this ship has been floating literally in a no man's land. No one knows that it's been sunk, either from San, uh, its point of uh, leaving in uh, California or in its point of arrival in the Philippines. And um, he radios back. You know, I see hundreds of young men in the water. He at first thinks they're coconuts because everyone is, you know, just sunken and 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 the oil is still on their face and he doesn't uh, engage and so the radio traffic goes out through and this fellow adrian marx here on the right <clears throat> flying a pby which is a uh, plane that can land in water um, in certain kinds of seas he's dispatched and he um actually does land against orders um in heavy seas so much so that the, the plane won't be able to take off. They'll have to uh, scuttle it, but begins to pick up survivors and um, strap them to the wings of the plane, lay them in on the deck uh, in the interior, uh, you know, turning the props, trying to turn ahead and then trying not to hit the prop, hit the hit the wave as it's coming in. It's, just, it's again, um, a heroic act of a, of a of an everyday American uh, doing something extraordinary. <clears throat> um, so finally, this uh, this news of the sinking of the ship called the USS Indianapolis is big news in the Pacific. And um, there's a picture of uh, Gwyn right there. I know John wanted to, this is him <clears throat> in a plane. I don't know if it's his PV-1. Uh, he's a I did not get to meet him. I do know his family. They're a wonderful um, people. They're also very supportive of the uh, what's now called the Gwyn Angel Scholarship Fund, which I talked about at the top of the um, talk here about, which supports the storytelling of um, the survivors of Indianapolis, named in, in Chuck's honor. He uh, who who first saw them floating in the water. There he is with another picture of the of, the, of a larger plane, and. Um, as I talk about the rescue here, I, I have this up because this is Irv um, Lefkowitz, and um, he is in Adrian Mark's plane. And I met Irv at the, as it says here, at the Union League uh, Club in Chicago in April of 2001. And so he's aboard, um, he's aboard Marx's plane there on the right. And I'm in Chicago, and if I recall correctly, Irv is from Chicago. His son had, had uh, contacted me and knew that I would be at the Union League Club. It was really, it's a great, it was a lunch, and you, you talk, and my father was there, and our young son. It was really, um, this whole experience was very moving to get to know all these people. And I looked over, I'm sitting there, and I, I think my father took this picture. I'm looking at Irv, and I said, Irv, have you ever... Uh, I'm nice to meet you. You know, I've talked a lot about the rescue and tried to talk to people. And have you ever talked about it? And he said, no, I've, I've, uh, I've never said a word in my life. And his son, I think relayed some story about how it, it took almost everything he had to get his father to come to this lunch. And um, I introduced him to the group and he stood up and said a few words, but after that, it was just very silent. Now, what's interesting about this <clears throat> is that Irv was part of the rescue um, crew. So you can imagine, you know, being the survivor yourself and living through this 24-7, but um, Irvin Lefkowitz and Adrian Marks and the, and the crew of the PBY arrive on, on scene, and their job is to pilot around and, as I say, pull bodies from the water who are, uh, who are either living or dead, and the, the dead have either been, you know, attacked by the sea itself so that, you know, they're disintegrating or they've been attacked by sea life, sharks, i.e., et cetera. And it just, it really, really stunned them. Um, I, it, it, Marx had 
you know, over 50 seamen aboard, I think, his airplane um, by the time he, he by the time he couldn't take any more. And soon there are, I'm gonna go back here. If you look at this map, you can see, uh, and this is in the book, by the way, um, the names of these rescue ships, the Cecil Doyle, the Ringness, the Bassett, et cetera. They've, they're all steaming out from different points because they've gotten the message um, that the ship is sunk. And it becomes uh, one of the largest, if not one of the largest at sea rescues during World War II. Um, And here we are aboard the Bassett. These are the survivors um, having been picked up by these um, destroyer or destroyer escorts, smaller naval ships, and then put aboard uh, these larger um, <clears throat> uh, ships. And as you can see, they've uh, been given new t-shirts and, uh, and uh, I guess shorts and you can see some scars on some of them. But on the other hand, some guys, you don't see anything. And what's remarkable here, I don't have a picture of it, but there ex there exist on the web. You know, within <clears throat> a couple of weeks, they're back playing volleyball and, you know, rebounding uh, quickly, at least physically, um, from the ordeal. They they get water, which is one of, the, one of the first things they want when they come aboard these rescue ships, water and food food less so, but the docks aboard have to give them just sips of water because if they were so dehydrated and so malnourished that if they were to gorge themselves, they would just get violently ill. Um, ultimately, well, I should say there are um, 880 sailors who are uh, perish in this five-day ordeal. Let's if let's say it goes down early Monday morning after midnight and the rescue is completed. Um, it really can the, the recovery of bodies goes to August 6th, which is an interesting date we'll get to in a moment. Um, Gwyn discovers them August 2nd. So it's a Monday through Friday kind of ordeal. Um, and 880 will perish and ultimately 300 and um, 16 will survive um, out of a crew of 1,195. There was another person aboard, um, Captain Stanley Crouch, uh, who was a, a ride along. He was a friend of Captain McVeigh's and he perishes as well. So there, there really were 1,196 people aboard, but 100, 1,195 crew, crew members. Um, and 316 survived and 880 were killed. So that <clears throat> that's a massive amount of casualties. I mean, in, in any case, I mean, but when it comes to World War II battles, um, no. But what happens is, is what happens on August 6th? Here, by the way, is um, more survivors arriving um, on Guam in structure. Um, this is what happens on August 6th. This might will look familiar to a lot of us. The gentleman on the right is Robert Oppenheimer. And the image we see on the left is the explosion of uh, the atomic bomb. So those components that the Indianapolis has delivered unbeknownst to the crew, the captain likely was privy um, there were uh, at least two uh, military personnel aboard who really did know what was going on and uh, were, uh, I believe, dispatched from uh, the Manhattan Project um, to take the components uh, to California to be loaded on the Indianapolis. But other than that, um, like I say, the idea of bringing the nuclear nuclear warfare into the 20th century was not anything that these young men could have um, imagined. But of course, <clears throat> when that happens on August 6th, um, it's a devastating blow for the Japanese people. And then on August 9th, um, of course, uh, 
Nagasaki is bombed as well. And here's the Enola Gay. The Enola Gay has backed over a bomb pit on Tinian Island, where earlier the Indianapolis had delivered these components. It's loaded into the Enola Gay and then um, dropped from there. Paul Tibbetts, um, the pilot of the Enola Gay, or one of them, uh, occasionally came to reunions in Indianapolis with the um, with the survivors. It was an interesting discussion he had with them. Um, and this is uh, Hiroshima and the aftermath of that. So while this has happened, these young men are in this state. They're on stretchers, they're in hospitals, and news comes to them on August 6th, as they're, as they're just convalescing, they, you know, they're discovered on August 2nd, that um, this device has been exploded in Japan, and it has an uh, unbelievable effect. And, uh, you know, do, I remember Dr. Haynes telling me that yeah, he, he was told it was an atomic bomb, and he, he knew what it he knew some ideas of atomic principles, so it wasn't completely clueless to him, but he was still uh, quite shocked. Um, so the reason there, I said about the casualties is that um, 880 American sailors die, you know, just weeks, literally before the war's end. So in America, stateside, and it, it, you know, this is before Twitter and all of our social media, but however, this disaster is enormous news in, uh, in in America. It's enormous news in U.S. Congress, and people are demanding for investigations. What went wrong? How could so many people die so close to the end? Of course, the, the great coincidence is, is that this ship, which is the victim of the disaster, is the one who really hastened the end of the war by delivering um, some of these components. Um, so essentially what happens if you've read the book or, you, uh, or know some of it from, from history is that, uh, Captain McVeigh seen here, um, is court-martialed. If you go back for a moment and talk about, um, that night they're sunk, um, it's dark, it's murky. He retires to his quarters, leaving orders to zigzag if conditions improve. They do. And then they, by the way, I need to make sure you know that they deteriorate then as well. So that there was really no way for this ship, remember 200 football fields long, to begin to zigzag uh, that quickly because Hashimoto himself uh, comes up and begins, and he's got a, he's got a tag on them. Um, the Court Martial is a whole other book. It's a whole other story. It's treated well in lots of accounts. Um, it's interesting um, because for two reasons, Commander Hashimoto is brought over to the United States. So the Court Martial begins December um, 3rd, and it's over by December 19th of 1945. Uh, the war has ended um, in Japan. On, uh, President Truman announces the end of the war um, here on uh, August 14th, 1945. And you see, Don, it's, it's front page news, the New York Times, Japan surrenders, end of war. If you look down in, in white there, cruiser sunk, 1,196 casualties. Um, that includes that uh, Captain Crouch. Um, took atom bomb, bam, bomb cargo to Guam. Well, it was actually Tinian, but it, it so it becomes a footnote below the fold to the end of the war, to the headline of the end of the war, which uh, the irony being that it had hastened that end. Um, so th the Japanese commander, uh, whose country has just surrendered, comes back to the Naval Yard in DC, and he actually is asked to testify on the government's behalf against Captain McVeigh, if you can believe that. Um, I, I can imagine that Commander Hashimoto was apprehensive. I don't know if he was terrified, but here, you know, just months earlier, they'd been combatants at war. He sunk this ship. 
uh, some of the personnel are in the courtroom. Um, as an aside, one of the great things about this story is that um, Commander Hashimoto's family has been living in Illinois for quite a while, and they attend the reunions of the survivors of USS Indianapolis um, on a regular basis and um, learn from each other and uh, are, are, are friends. It's quite, it's quite fascinating. It may be because Commander Hashimoto, to his great courage, stands up in the um, court martial and says, there's nothing that Command uh, Captain McVeigh could have done to avoid me sinking him. I had him. I was not that far away. It was not a tough shot. Nothing he could have done. Glenn Donahoe, a submarine commander, um, <clears throat> an American one, testifies as well that zigzagging has negligible effect um, as a defensive posture against torpedoing. Even so, um, oh, and by the way, McVeigh is also charged with, um, so, you know, roughly failure to abandon ship in a timely manner. So remember the ship goes down, what did I say, between 12 and 17 minutes? I mean, you know, that's, that's not a lot of time. And they drop the the government drops that charge against him because it's hard. They knew it'd be hard to prove. But the one thing that wouldn't be hard to prove because he, as he as he himself comes out of the water, having spent time in a raft with a crew of uh, of his young seamen. John, I remember John Spinelli from New Mexico. Um, he's a great person. You know, talking about how much as he sat on that raft and looked at Captain McVeigh, he admired his leadership his calm steadiness, his sense of uh, creating some discipline within this raft in which they had nothing, um, but to do watches and to try to keep a log book with some soggy paper, all of which was likely just for show, I could imagine. Um, he is, uh, McVeigh, uh, nonetheless, when he's uh, rescued and brought aboard a ship, he says, you know what? Um, they're going to get me for failing to zigzag, which we need to pause on for just a moment. So what that means is, is he's been sunk. I'm not, he's not going to be court-martialed for the death of the ship or the loss, excuse me, the loss of the ship. But because when the moon came out, his orders were to be doing that zigzag maneuver. And then the moon went away. And so technically he was in violation of orders. That also means, however, if they had not been sunk and he had failed to zigzag, when he arrived in the Philippines, he equally could have been court-martialed as well. Or some, some form of punishment might have been meted out if you did really want to split the hairs that way. He accepts that responsibility. Um, he, he is court-martialed. He's demoted in points, et cetera, he will never really make, he's not booted out of the service. Um, he's, because of his record, he comes from a long line of naval officers. Um, he's essentially uh, gets a desk job and uh, lives out the rest of his career doing that. Uh, incredibly unhappy, however, as far as I know, as it concerns his relationship to this ship, which has to have been one of the most momentous things to happen to him. Um, and this brings us to this moment. This is 15 years after this picture. This is December of 1945. And this is July of 1960, this could be on the very day of July 30th or 31st, the very first reunion of the USS Indianapolis survivors in Indianapolis, Indiana, um, held for the first time to bring them back 15 years later um, to talk about what happened, at which point they also begin to discuss how they are determined to clear their captain's name, whom they insist should not be held responsible um, for the loss of so much death, uh, excuse me, for causing so much death. You have here um, uh, Giles McCoy in the white is one of the founders of the survivors organization. 
these men have all sadly passed away, uh, but they've come together. Um, they, the, this four were in a raft together. And um, this is 1960. Um, McCoy is a chiropractor. Uh, Felton Outland there uh, in the um, second from the right with the glasses is a, uh, lives in um, a small Southern town and he's a farmer. Um, we don't have self-help. We don't have psychology, you know, uh, apps on our phone to, uh, you know, calm ourselves down. Men don't go to see uh, psychiatrists and they have the brilliant idea though, that if they get together, they can tell the story maybe, or figure out what happened to them. And we'll get to that more in a moment, but here is Captain McVeigh. And here he is on the right with his wife, Louise, living now in his retirement, it's 1960, um, quite happily with her. She um, will eventually have cancer and pass away, which would be a great blow to him. Um, but he's, he's there at the reunion um, reluctantly, so reluctantly. Why? Because in the intervening 15 years, some people, and typically the families of those sailors who are deceased, who died in the sinking, were understandably more than upset with Captain McVeigh. Because remember, um, the U.S. government has said that he is responsible for this disaster. And so he's, Captain McVeigh has gotten letters uh, you know, to that effect, you know, my son would be alive if not for your negligence, et cetera. Um, I went to the house where McVeigh was living um, in the last months and years of his life and was able to talk to his stepson um, who, you know, said to me uh, one day he was, it was in Litchfield, Connecticut. He was walking by a door and he heard soft crying coming from the other side of the door he opened it and it was McVeigh uh, who was the person crying. And he he basically had a you know letter in his hand or he was referencing that I just can't take uh, this anymore. And this being, how can we imagine, you know, guilt, um, regret, uh, the letters that would come, et cetera. So <clears throat> however, the men uh, are, are um, thrilled to see him. As you can see here, uh, this is the arrival of McVeigh uh, at the Indianapolis airport. And there's Chuck Gwynn, the angel, next to him. There's McVeigh looking dapper in his straw hat and white suit. Um, and these are other survivors. They're now, you know, they're, they're now approaching middle age. They're 30 years old and above. Remember, they were 19 20 aboard the ship. So maybe they're 35. Uh, and this reunion is just quite an amazing experience. And they gather together in a room and McVeigh and McCoy and a group of the founding kind of fellows who had this idea, because remember there was no internet back then. So to even get everyone back together was an enormous task. Um, looking at phone books, uh, sending out letters to newspapers, calling the Department of Motor Vehicles and asking for registration numbers. You know, you know hey, I remember that Charlie lived in Missouri. Uh, well, I'll call the DMV in Missouri and try, see if I can find, you know, uh, Charlie Smith. And it, it was that kind of legwork to get everyone back together. Our ship has sunk under us in the middle of the night with everything we own. So when we're rescued, we're really, it's almost as if we're emerging from the sea, reborn with nothing. We're young. We've been through this horrible, scorching experience. And believe it or not, if my hitch isn't over in the Navy or the Marines, because there are Marines aboard as well, um, I still have to go back in and finish my service. But I don't have any money. I might get a little leave here. But so there are guys who are gambling, playing dice, you know, trying to get train fare to go back home to wherever because uh, they have a bit of leave before they have to go back and, and uh, show back up at, at, at post. So this is a different world altogether. Um, but they did gather in this room and 
McCoy and McVeigh and et cetera, others were standing up on a dais sitting there and they're just the men, um, as you see the wives and girlfriends here, who, by the way, are completely, I think, fascinated by what their husbands might be saying, because um, I talked about Richard Thalen <clears throat> earlier. You know, Richard Thalen was a wonderful guy. Sally passed away now. Um, he was a truck driver for years, and he was married. Um, when he was first married, it took him it was seven years before he even told his wife that he'd been aboard the ship and had sunk. Um, so for them to come together here and talk about, hey, you know, are you, you know, hey, you over there, I thought you died or, you know, uh, McCoy said, OK, fellas, the door shut. What's what happened? Who's going to start? And somebody would say, well, I, I'm uh, I'm here. I wonder if Joe is here or I'm here and I'm I've lived for 15 years. The idea that maybe I killed you know, Jim, maybe I drowned him. Maybe I went out of my head drinking salt water or not salt water, but from <clears throat> just exposure. And then Jim would stand and say, no, you dummy, I'm not dead. I'm right. You, I, you didn't kill me. Really? So they'd have these reunions and begin to piece together what they could recollect had happened to them. Um, and this is them today. Um, sadly, these men are all um, deceased now, but this is at one of the reunions um, that I attended. Not all these men. There's Captain Bill Toady um, in the back there, uh, back row, first, second from the left. He was the commander of the submarine USS Indianapolis. Has been a great champion uh, for the survivors in their quest to exonerate their captain, and also as uh, um, a storyteller or a, a guardian of their story. Um, so we just, we're going to go, I want to go back, you know, we're going to go from these young men here uh, laying on the, you know, the deck of this ship, thinking that they'd already died uh, and, and somehow had not yet passed away. And we end up in, um, say, Chicago here in April of 2001. This on the far right uh, is Gus Kay, who I believe was 16 when he was aboard the ship from Chicago. Um, uh, McGuigan is right next to him um, with, the, with the glasses. And then there's Mike Carrilla and Lorraine Carrilla. Um, and then Jack Miner uh, on the far left. Um, he was the radio man I referenced earlier who was in, um, <clears throat> you know, feeling that he had gotten off uh, a signal. So uh, it was such a pleasure to get to know them and work with them and, and um, hear them tell their story. This is uh, Eugene Morgan. I bring him up because uh, this, again, was part of the In Harm's Way book tour. This is a T-shirt he was wearing. Um, you'll notice um, there is a correction here on this T-shirt. It says 317 men survived. Um, it's actually 316. There was, um, for the longest time, a discrepancy in the records where one fellow was um, accounted as uh, killed in action, but but wasn't. So it's now 316. I bring up Eugene. Here he is. We're having lunch, um, wearing a shirt. We're in Seattle. And we can see a bridge out that window there, which is on the right. And Eugene was a fireman <clears throat> and I, um, with a loved family and from a large family. And however, living in Seattle, you know, you have to go over bridges and he couldn't because of what had happened to him aboard the ship. So that he didn't, you know, some of the men didn't, couldn't go into swimming pools. Some couldn't take baths. They could take showers, but not baths. Uh, you know, a lot of them didn't like to swim at all. Eugene just was not crazy about going over bridges and water. Um, and what was so interesting about writing this at that point in my life was to hear these uh, older men, you know, so he's, Eugene is 70 here now, um, perhaps a little bit older. 
So he is that generation that Tom Brokaw kind of intersected with in 1990 and began to write about. Um, and I found that the American male it could be a, true of a lot. It didn't have to be American, but at some point, it, as, 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 as we get older, in particular men, are, are willing to talk and be vulnerable and talk about things and to tell a stranger such as myself, because we had met at the reunions, but I didn't know Eugene all that well, um, you know, to tell me he was afraid to go over a bridge it takes a lot of courage. And it was really through their courage and, and wanting to tell a story, their story, that the book got written. The end result of doing these reunions is the uh, USS Indianapolis Memorial. This is at the Canal Walk in Indianapolis, Indiana. And if any of you have been down to Indianapolis, you can easily find this and you'll find some writing about the ship. You'll find some names. And uh, this was, there were a lot of reasons for them to have reunions. There are um, <clears throat> family affairs. Um, but this one of the stated concrete was to build this memorial. Um, because again, remember when they begin to gather, if you go back to that New York Times headline, you know, um, where does it, they're literally buried under the headline, the most historic headline of the American century, which is World War II is over. And in the hullabaloo of the, uh, the, the joyousness of that war's end, their trouble is forgotten. And they're left to really suffer in silence, um, not really listed in, in history books, not talked about much until the movie Jaws. Um, which uh, we'll get to in just a moment. But when the book came out, I was we, we were very, we being the publisher and myself, very fortunate to have as a champion of it, um, Tom Brokaw here on the right. And then there's Giles McCoy and Lou Haynes um, as part of a special issue um, about heroes, which none of these three uh, people would call themselves heroes, but... Of course, they have done uh, very heroic things. And uh, I like this picture of McCoy and uh, on the left and Dr. Haynes on the right. If you look at Lou, his name is Lou, Lewis Haynes, you can see how slight he is. McCoy was more of an athletic Marine. <clears throat> but Dr. Haynes, what I learned is that the it didn't matter how strong you were. It, I mean, it mattered, but just as important was kind of your intestinal fortitude, the heart that you had. And and uh, you can and Haynes uh, survived. Another Marine aboard, uh, Captain Park, perished. He swam around just trying to save so many people. He just finally burnt out and uh, and died. Um, this is Ed Hain. I mean, excuse me, Ed Brown. Um, and Lyle Umenhofer, who's in the white shirt laughing, uh, and Verlin Fortin sitting in a, at a table there. Um, we're, in, we're in California, and that's Ed, who I talked about um, singing the Yellow Rose of Texas with his buddy, um, who swam away. Um, and this, I want to, we're getting close to the end here, um, but I wanted to show you this. Um, this is Bill Thurkettle. And Bill Thurkettle uh, lived in a small town in Michigan and never spoke about the experience aboard the Indianapolis at all. And um, he uh, came to me when, uh, it, I, in Traverse City, Michigan, we have the National Cherry Festival. And they asked if I wanted to, it's my hometown, if I wanted to be in the, in the parade. And I said, sure, it would be great because the book had come out. And I said, it'd be great to have someone who's aboard the ship. And I asked Bill and he came. and. Um, we ended up doing a book event, uh, signing together, but he just sat on the back of the Cadillac. Um, you know how it is in a parade and it had a magnetic sticker, Bill, William Thurkettle, survivor of the USS Indianapolis on the side. And I was sitting there with our, our very young kids and it was, I was behind him and, you know, people were clapping for the bands and this, and then they would kind of they'd see the car and Bill 
and they'd read the sign like Indian USS Indian Nap World War, and they they you know start to clap like this, and you know kind of grow louder and louder. And Bill, who'd never said anything, you know, he's just sitting there, and I just saw him. He just lifted his arms, and it's like he's just floating down the street, you know, on the applause, on the recognition, and uh, we we you know it was a two mile parade, and he ended got out we shook hands you know and, we, and he left we never really talked i he, he hadn't identified himself he had i was not able to find him when i was researching the book there were so many things that happened after the book came out because it was very popular it was on the new york times list for a long long time and uh so people would read it and you know family would say hey bill weren't you isn't this part of what you were part of and then he, they would read it and then that's how they would come forward and we would meet but that to me is really just one of the most special memories i have uh, of of having written this book um so doug is a uh, time check it's 110 it's been a incredibly uh, quick uh, 60 or 70 minutes uh, i know you have a video here at the end of it'll probably take uh, three to five minutes we'll go ahead and show that and then uh, open up the questions and try to end around 1 30 or so is that okay? Do we want to just skip the video or do we? No, I, I think, think uh, people have hung in there. Uh, I think the video is uh, most compelling. Give a few minutes for questions and uh, we'll okay. end at one. Three. Sure. I want to jump in real quick um, just in case people do have to leave, um, just to put up for a couple minutes um, the uh, the QR code that we have for uh, just a second. So it'll, this will end your share for a second. Um, and this is just our evaluation part for so if people want to take a take a quick put up your put up your put up your phone and uh do a QR code we'll put this up at the end too uh, when we're about ready to conclude but for folks who have to jump off if you want to uh take a quick QR code kind of thing and do a eval we'd we'd certainly appreciate it um uh, uh you if you want to uh queue up for the the, the uh, video just say a couple words we'll leave that up and then I'll I'll, I'll stop my share and then you can resume, Doug. Okay, so the video is ready to go and I can reshare, so. Okay, so if, you wanna, if uh, folks wanna just look at that real quick and then we'll um, I'm gonna stop sharing here right now um, and we'll continue. Okay, so. I'm... All right, so now you can just share again, Doug, and we'll be, we'll be ready to resume. Okay, it's gonna pop up here in just a moment. No. There we go, guys. Okay. Um, but <laughs> okay. All right, I'm going to start this just for a minute, and then I'll jump ahead on it. floated for nearly five days in the South Pacific battling sharks before being rescued. Their story was recalled in the movie Jaws. Are you on the Indianapolis? What happened? Japanese submarine slammed two torpedoes into our side, Chief. 1,100 men went into the water. The vessel went down in 12 minutes. Didn't see the first shark for about half an hour. Doug Stanton is author of a new best-selling book about the Indy and its survivors called In Harm's Way. Giles McCoy is one of the survivors. Gentlemen, good to see you both. Thank you. Thank you. Doug, let me start with you. I'm going to jump away. I don't know who that young guy is there. Well, let me... Uh... ...in the South Pacific. It was so secret, Giles, that no one knew where you guys were going. And on the way back, you were unescorted because no one could know where you'd been. You were 19. Yeah, but well, we weren't on our way back. We'd already dropped the bomb off at Tinian, and it was later put on the Enola Gay and dropped on Hiroshima. Uh, we were going over to Leyte to join a task force to get ready for the invasion of Japan proper, and we were getting ready to get right into the main part of the war. You remember obviously and vividly when that torpedo slammed into the indianapolis i know that you were thrown across the room yes you ended up in the water like so many others yes you were concerned what went through your mind immediately was get away from this ship 
because yes. you could get sucked down with it. Well, and we were always taught that on board any ship that is sinking, you want to try to get away from the high side because if you get on the low side, it'll suck you down. And, uh, and so but as soon as I hit the water, I walked down the side of the ship and slid down the keel and into the water and uh, started swimming hard. And when I look back, why the ship was going down bow first and men were still jumping off the fantail and hitting the screws. And uh, so I swam real hard until it finally pulled me down. You were lucky enough to, to get into a life raft. Yes, most of the guys I first joined up with, uh, some of the men that I first got with didn't even have life jackets. And so uh, one of them, we had to wait till we got a dead body to take a di life jacket off of him and put it on him. Almo and almost 200 guys over the course of those four and a half days were taken by sharks. At least that many. Uh, mm -hmm. in some groups had lots more. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Haynes, our senior medical officer, his group, they had right at 400 men, and only 93 of them made it. Mm -hmm. you, you at some times were kicking sharks. I mean, they would, you would yeah. see them circle, and then when you'd see the dorsal fin go underwater, you knew they were coming yes, for somebody. Yes, this was shark attack, and it was coming. And they would come up underneath you, and they have to turn sideways to bite you. And like I've told Doug and other people, you, they have a membrane that comes over their eyeballs, and they have to turn sideways to strike you. And if you can strike them in the eye, that really hurts them. R reading your account of this and, and through Doug, I was thinking that's got to be the worst thing anyone can go through. But you say that the worst part of those four and a half days, not the sharks, it was the thirst. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, the first couple of days, I was a chow hound back in, uh, in my younger days. And first couple of days of hunger was in there, but then that left you. But the thirst never did. And the thirst just drove you out of your mind and drove a lot of the men out of their mind. And the, some of the things that I always say in my lifetime to other people, don't judge people that go through crises like this because everybody has a breaking point. Mm -hmm. And so you don't know when your breaking point's coming. Yeah, I know you said that sometimes it would have been easier to die Much than easier. survive. It really, and a lot of the guys felt that. And a lot of guys drowned themselves because it was easier to, than to continue on and, and try to make yourself survive the ordeal. What, what do you want people to know about these guys, not only the ones who survived, but the ones who didn't survive. Just what Gil just said, I mean, what he just, <coughs> six years ago, going to live. And if I could inject them, is what he hauled out of the water. And the captain of the Indianapolis. Uh, that, that's, a, that's another story. Well, and he was court-martialed. Yes, and, and if I could inject something real quick, and I know we have so much time here, but uh, just recently, uh, the Secretary of the Navy, England, uh, had the courage to go on and buck the Navy admirals and get our skipper exonerated. Mm. And our, our skipper was unjustly court-martialed. And, and I want to I try to let the, the American people know why we fought all these years to get him exonerated, because he was not guilty of anything. They charged him with hazarding his ship by failing to zigzag, but yet and all they gave him a directive that gave him the privilege of not zigzagging at his own discretion. And, but, and they, but they court-martialed him for it. As you mentioned, he was exonerated recently, but he committed suicide yes, because he couldn't because handle it, the burden it, in 1968. Everybody accused him of it. All the people, if I would have been lost, possibly my mother would have accused him. And so the people that lost loved ones on the Indianapolis, you know, they, they accused him of this. And, uh, and he was not guilty of anything. What do you want people to know about your colleagues and your comrades? Well, first of all, what a wonderful guys they are. Um, and, and I get emotional when I talk about them. There's nobody out there like our bunch. There's nobody. We're, we're buddies, and we will be buddies until we all die. And that's why we all fought for Captain McVeigh, because he was one of us, and he, his honor was at stake. Uh, he was a combat veteran. And any combat veteran, where he, whether he's in Europe or Pacific, they know what I'm talking about. And there's an honor to get out there and serve your country. And when you do, you do the very best job you can, but you become comrades. Everybody is our buddies. Mm -hmm. Well, Giles Important. McCoy. Mr. McCoy, thank you. It's an honor to meet You're you. You're most welcome. Doug Stan, nice to have you here as well. 7.53, we're back right after this. You're welcome.
Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine, Doug. I have a I have a two questions have uh, come in. So when you're uh, have complete, I'll go ahead and get into the questions and I encourage our participants if they have any questions to continue to type them into the Q and A and I'll go ahead and read them uh, when they come up. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm all set here. Yeah. Uh, well, great. Uh, so first of all, before we get into the questions, I simply just simply want to thank you for taking time out to uh, chat with us today. Uh, help us honor the legacy of the Indianapolis and learn a little bit about our military history. Certainly, uh, time has gone very, very quickly and uh, an excellent presentation. So thank you. Thank the, you. Uh, I'm first sorry question. To I didn't realize I was going on for so long. It's I, I, I really enjoyed it, though. Thank you for the chance. The uh, first comes from Eli, 12.24 p.m., so almost an hour ago. Good afternoon, Doug. Thanks for giving this presentation. Having served in the Navy for 25 years, I've always been fascinated by the story and how strong these sailors were. As you know, our move rep system is based off of this story, which is what piqued my interest. No questions. Just wanted to say thank you for sharing such an important and uh, such an important and unbelievable story of life, compassion, and service. The next one is a question, and I actually had a similar question in my mind. Do you know what the logic was behind why the U.S. brought the Japanese commander, previous enemy combatant that killed U.S. sailors, to testify at a U.S. trial against a U.S. captain during the war? Doesn't seem very respectful respectful to the families of the deceased. It actually, my part B of that question be, and why did he come? It, just because we invited him doesn't mean that he would come. So uh, there's two questions uh, boiled into one there for you. Well, it goes back to the idea that um, he uh, um, it was such a traumatic disaster that um, uh, I'm trying to think of an analogy today. Well, it's like 9/11. Say, you know, 9/11 happened. Who, who's responsible? We need an answer. We need to respond to this now. We need to figure out who. Uh, enabled this to happen. And one of the ways to do that is to bring over Hashimoto. I mean, so that, 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 that urge is greater than the, uh, than the realization that, you know, it's not very cool to have the command, you know, the Japanese commander come over who's, um, and testify against an American, but, um, the, the war is over and America wants to move on. The Navy wants to move on. And also remember, McVeigh also uh, admitted to the charge. So that's all I can say. It just, uh, it, w they needed some quick answers um, as to who was guilty for this. And they felt that Hashimoto, they actually, well, you know, it backfired because Hashimoto did not testify the way that they had thought he would, uh, which is really quite remarkable. And what was Hashimoto's uh, incentive for wanting to come over? I would have thought you know, he'd let bygones be bygones and uh, stay in Japan. Oh, I, I, yeah, I see that quite. Yeah, I, yeah, it's funny. No, I, I don't think he had any incentive. I don't think he had a choice. I think um, as a former combatant, there may have been, I don't know. Some, I hadn't thought I could find out some operational control over his actions as the war was winding down and, um, or had wound down, but uh, he wasn't there to um, pillory Captain McVeigh uh, <clears throat> at all. Um, so I don't think he had a choice. Great, thank you. The uh, I'll say some statements for the end. Uh, next question is why did they deliver the components by ship? Couldn't they have gone by airplane? You know, that's, fu that's funny too. Um, the, uh, I guess the reasoning was to just ship was safer because although that sounds weird in retrospect because they were sunk, but going from San Francisco to Pearl Harbor to Tinian, that is the war is still going, but that's a backwater of the war. The front line now is moving forward to the Philippines and northward into the J Japanese home islands. So um, the, uh, shipping seemed the, the, the safest route. It's interesting, I forgot to say this, but they actually had, in a case of abandoned ship, 
uh, which, you know, they were assuming it could be orderly. They had a life raft for this cask of uranium, et cetera, other components. And that was supposed to be offloaded first into its own raft before anything else. Of course, that didn't happen. Uh, thank you. Uh, question actually from the book. Uh, if you read the book, it makes note that when the Indianapolis was leaving San Francisco, it paused outside the uh, Golden Gate Bridge in order to get word seemingly that the uh, testing in Los Alamos was successful. And uh, can you speculate what would have happened if uh, it wasn't successful? Would they have returned to the pier or what would have uh, gone yeah, on? Yeah, you know, <laughs> if you when you watch the movie Oppenheimer, you see that uh, – that truck leave the Trinity site, right? And it's going down that gravel road. It's headed down the mountain and into California to that Naval yard to drop this off um, to the ship. I suspect that no, that they wouldn't have left because, um, but I, uh, I can't say that definitively. Uh, great, thank you. So I have uh, two statements, a question and then we'll bring up the QR code. So uh, one statement was, I can't scan the QR code, but the whole event was spectacular, exceeded my expectations. So thank you for that. Uh, second comment was uh, just knowing that I believe the interview and the video is a young Matt Lauer. So we can confirm that was a young Matt Lauer, just as that was a young Doug Stanton. <laughs> yeah. And the uh, last note here is, who has won the scholarship and what have they said about it? Well, that's interesting. If they, um, you go to... Uh www uh i think it's indielegacy.com just just type in uss indianapolis legacy and that'll lead you to a link to the scholarship program and it has been going now since 2004 or 5 so there have been dozens or hundreds of recipients and that they've all been young people uh headed to college um, who've received money. Again, the, the, the Glynn and Goodall family has endowed this, and Stanton and I, we, we, we began the, um, the effort with some monies from uh, the hardcover sale of the book, and then thankfully the Glynn family came in and endowed it in perpetuity. So it is, it, the, the point of it was, and uh, talking to any educators or who want to listen to this later too, is, you know, to get the young, get to get a younger generation to look forward and talk with veterans and capture their oral histories. And so it's been very successful. Great, uh, thank you for that. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead and conclude the day. Again, Doug, we uh, sincerely thank you for taking time to educate all of us, especially during this important uh, Veterans Day week. Uh, so we'll go ahead and bring up the QR code and we thank all our attendees for taking out of your time out of your busy schedule as well to come and learn, so appreciate that. Yes, I'm. Uh, thank you all for being here, and um, I'm sorry I couldn't see you in person, but I'm very honored to have been able to talk.